Hey y'all, today we're going to be making sourdough pizza. And the key to any good sourdough pizza is a nice ripe starter. Here we're looking at my starter and it is not ripe. As you can see, this rubber band is the starting line from where it was fed a few days ago and it rose up about, oh, maybe an inch or so and then dropped back down, which is my cue to feed it. So I'm going to do that. Now, the other key to good sourdough baking is timing. You want to feed your starter about 36 hours before you're ready to eat. And I'll include in the comment section below a timeline for sourdough pizza making just for your reference. So let's get to the feeding. If you don't have one already, I highly recommend getting a kitchen scale. This one's made by Nicewell. It's not that expensive. And let me tell you, it is a workhorse in the kitchen. It will help you measure your ingredients precisely so that your sourdough starter gets just the right amount of food. Okay, so I have a bowl here, and in that bowl, I am going to place approximately 60 grams of unfed starter. So that's the old starter that you saw in the jar there. To that unfed starter, I am going to add about 65 grams of flour. And this is about 15 grams of rye flour and about 50 grams of regular all-purpose flour. Next we're going to add about 65 grams of warm water to that mixture. And finally to give our sourdough starter just a little bit of sweetness which might make some sourdough bakers head explode, I'm going to add to this mixture a dollop, let's say about a little over a half teaspoon of raw honey. Now give that mixture a good stir with a chopstick and that'll get those ingredients well incorporated. And then we will have fed our starter and we're gonna transfer that mixture back to a clean jar and mark it with a rubber band so that we can tell when our starter is either doubled or tripled in size and is ready to use to leaven our sourdough. Let's talk about flour. For this recipe, I used double zero flour. It can be a little bit hard to find, but if you can find it, it's definitely worth it. If not, no problem. Regular bread flour will work just fine here. Okay, so into a clean bowl, we are going to put 500 grams of Tipo double zero flour, 10 grams of kosher salt, and we're gonna give that mixture a good stir with our whisk to get those ingredients thoroughly incorporated. Now it's time to check back on our starter. As you can see, it's about tripled from where it started at the line of the rubber band here. And that means it's foamy and active and ready to go. So we are going to take a measuring cup and pour in 375 grams of room temperature water. And to that water, we are going to add 100 grams of active starter. Now it's time to take our whisk and stir up those ingredients, get them really well incorporated. To the flour and salt mixture, we are going to add the starter mixture. And we are going to take a rubber scraper and get that mixed up really well and form it into a nice shaggy ball. Okay, now that that's done, we're going to cover our dough with a plate so it doesn't dry out, and we are going to set a timer for 30 minutes, and we are going to start our first stretch and fold. Okay, so it's been about 30 minutes, and it's time to stretch and fold our dough. I'm taking a rubber scraper here, and I am picking up one side of the dough with the rubber scraper and folding it over on itself while I'm turning the bowl. And that's a process that you're gonna to wanna to repeat anywhere between eight to 12 times per stretch and fold session. And you're gonna to wanna to do a total of three stretch and fold sessions, 30 minutes apart. And with each session, you're gonna notice the texture of the dough really starts to change. It goes from being shaggy and sticky to smooth and elastic. And by the time you're done, it will be a nice cohesive ball and we'll get it ready for the bulk rise. Okay, so we've stretched and folded our dough three times over an hour and a half, and we are ready to bulk rise it. That means we're gonna put a plate over the bowl to make sure the dough does not dry out, and you can either leave it on your countertop overnight for about 12 to 15 hours, or if you need a little bit more time before you're ready to bake, you can also leave it in the fridge for up to 24 hours. This dough is pretty forgiving. Secretly, I've left it in my fridge for up to 30 hours, don't tell and it was just fine. 
Well, it's been about 18 hours and I have taken my dough out of the refrigerator and it's hard to tell from this angle, but it is about well, a little less than double the size, but it's definitely been sitting long enough for a good, strong bulk fermentation. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a baking sheet and I am going to spray it with some nonstick cooking spray. These baking sheets come with a tight fitting plastic lid and I like to take the lid and spray it with cooking spray as well because sometimes when the dough balls are rising they will touch the inside of the lid and this will keep them from sticking. So next I'm going to flour my work surface and I'm going to turn the dough out of the bowl and onto the work surface and start shaping my pizza dough balls. If you have a bench scraper, this is a great time to use one. This little flexible plastic bench scraper really comes in handy when you're trying to handle sticky dough. You can see it even sticks to the bench scraper. It's really gonna stick to your hands. So when you turn it out on the work surface, be sure and coat your hands thoroughly with flour because it will help keep them from sticking. And if the dough starts to stick to the bench, just give it a little more flour and that should do the trick. So I'm gonna get this out of the bowl and I'm gonna divide this dough ball into three relatively equal portions. That makes about three 12 inch pizzas. Now, if you're a stickler for detail, you can weigh the dough balls to make sure they're equal sizes. I just like to go by the look and feel of them. So I'm gonna cut this into three portions and I think I cut one of them a little bit too light, and so I'm gonna borrow a little bit of dough from the others and stick it onto the skinny dude over on the right. Once again, this dough is very sticky, and that is a result of the high hydration. There's a lot of water in this dough, and the water will give the dough a lightness and a nice texture. So you may be cursing it now, that's okay, curse away, but you will be thanking it later. And some of that stickiness actually comes in handy, as you see here, when I'm tucking the edges of the dough up under itself, those edges will better stick together because the dough is sticky. So I'm gonna tuck the edges under, I'm gonna use my bench scraper while gently turning the dough with my other hand, to seal it up and then I'm going to repeat that process with the other two dough balls and keep that bench scraper handy you are going to need it keep tucking and drawing your edges in while you're folding your dough over and you will have a nice cohesive dough ball Okay, so now that we've formed our dough balls, we're gonna put them on those prepared cookie sheets and we are going to cover them with a light coating of oil so that they don't dry out. Uh, I have only two of those covered baking sheets in my kitchen, so I put one dough ball on one baking sheet and I put two socially distanced apart on the other baking sheet. That gives those two dough balls a bit of room to expand when they're on the second rise. And the second rise will be anywhere from about two to four hours at room temperature. Remember to cover your dough balls while they're rising so that they don't dry out. So while our dough is rising at room temperature for two to four hours, let's take a minute to talk about toppings. I've got a homemade red sauce, a little grated Parmesan, and some shredded mozzarella. I've also got some ground sausage, a few pieces of pepperoni I had laying around, some torn fresh basil, chopped red bell pepper, some caramelized onion, and some sauteed mushrooms. About an hour before you bake, you're gonna wanna preheat your oven to as high a temperature as it will go. Mine goes to 550, so if you can, kick it up that high and place your baking steel about six inches from the broiler. For me, that's the second rung on my oven rack. While our oven is preheating, we're gonna talk a little bit about cooking technique. I love parchment paper. Can't say enough nice things about it. You're gonna need it when you're making pizza. It will make your life easier. Get some. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take each individual dough ball and place it on its own individual piece of parchment paper. And we are going to stretch each dough ball by hand to make our pizza crust. And we're gonna do that with a little technique I like to call jazz hands. What you're gonna do is you're gonna take your hands and flour them pretty generously, because remember this dough is sticky. And you're gonna gently place both of your hands, fingers together on top of the dough, and you're gonna let the pads of your hands and fingers 
gently start to work the dough outward towards the edge. So you're going to put your fingers together, spread them slowly, and you're placing your hands on the dough, but you're not really pressing into the dough because remember, we want to preserve all of those little air bubbles that we worked so hard to cultivate. It's those air bubbles that are going to give our homemade pizza an authentic restaurant look and taste. So gently work that dough, repeat the process until the dough is your desired thickness. Now remember the dough is gonna rise about a quarter inch or more in the oven. So do keep that in mind when you're gauging the thickness of the dough while you're stretching it. Okay, I like mine a little on the thin side, so I'm gonna work this a little bit more and then I'm gonna put some toppings on it. It's time to get saucy. Once your dough rounds are complete, you wanna put your desired toppings on them. I'm starting, as I said, with a red sauce. I'm gonna spread that generously, but keep in mind you don't want it to get soupy because the more moisture you have on top of your dough, the greater the likelihood that your dough will turn out soggy, and we do not want that. So I'm gonna give this a nice, even, thorough coating of homemade red sauce, which will give it a nice tomatoey tang. And then we're gonna bring in a little freshly grated Parmesan, layer on a little mozzarella, some red peppers, throw on a little caramelized onion, some sausage and some pepperoni, and we have got ourselves a pizza, people. Boy, does that look good. Okay, so just take the other two dough rounds and put whatever toppings you like on them. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how to get this ready to go in the oven. Now, parchment paper will tend to turn brown and even burn on a high temperature oven. So one of the things we're gonna do is cut the parchment to fit, but we're gonna leave a little excess around one end of the pizza. And we are going to use that as a pull tab for removing the parchment from the oven when it's time. And that'll make sense in just a minute. Okay, so we're gonna get this pizza onto our peel and we are going to take it over to our preheated oven and put it in, here we go. So we've got our pizza on the pizza peel and it's time to put it in the oven. You're gonna wanna do that with that pull tab facing backward. And that's gonna make sense in a second. You're gonna put the pizza in and you're gonna time it for exactly two minutes. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna let that pizza start to get nice and hot and the parchment paper will separate really easy from the pizza. If you leave the parchment paper in there the entire cooking time, the pizza will not brown and crisp on the bottom. So leave it in for exactly two minutes and after two minutes, pull the pizza out very quickly using gloves. Get that pull tab, pull it out. You're gonna need a spatula to provide you with some resistance so it'll come easily, but it should free itself pretty easily right from underneath that pizza. Slide the pizza back in and cook it for anywhere from three to four minutes. You'll know it's ready to come out when it is brown on the edges like this and has little char marks both on the sides and underneath. There you have it, folks. Now that we've made our pizza, there's really only one thing left to do, and I think you know what that is. Spoiler alert, it didn't suck. So you see, sourdough pizza requires a little bit of planning and preparation and a really hot oven, but I hope this video has shown you that it is very doable. If you do decide to make it, I'd love to know. Leave me a comment and tell me how it turned out. So that's it for this one. Happy cooking, y'all. See you next time.